So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Irene Trowell Harris. She's the former director of the Department of Affairs, VA, Center for Women Veterans. She was nominated in June 2001 and approved by the White House on October 2nd, 2001 and served as director until September of 2013. In this role, she was the primary advisor to the Secretary of Veterans Affairs on legislation, programs, and issues related to women veterans. Prior to her appointment, Dr. Trowell Harris served as Director of Veterans Affairs Office of Inspector General's General Healthcare Inspections Regional Office in Washington, D.C. In this position, she directed a multidisciplinary staff of inspectors responsible for conducting oversight reviews to improve the economy, effectiveness, and efficiency of Veterans Affairs programs. Concurrent with her position in the VA's Office of the Inspector General, Dr. Trowell Harris served 38 years in the U.S. Air Force and Air National Guard, retiring as a Major General on September of 2001. During her military career, Dr. Trowell Harris held numerous senior leadership positions, including Chief Nurse Executive, Flight Nurse Examiner, Commander, Advisor for Nursing and Readiness, Office of the Air Force Surgeon General, Assistant to the Director and Board of Directors, Air National Guard, and Military Representative to the Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Services for the Air National Guard. She was a 1997 Air Force representative for the Committee on Women in the NATO Forces Conference held in Istanbul, Turkey, and speaker for the Air Force in Pretoria, South Africa at an International Women's Conference. Dr. Chow Harris is an adjutant fa graduate faculty member at the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences and served as an ex-officio member to the Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Services and VA's representative on the White House Council on Women and Girls. She also served as a Senior Social and Policy Specialist for the American Nurses Association. Born in Aiken, South Carolina, Dr. Trowell Harris is a graduate of Columbia Hospital School of Nursing, Jersey City State University, where she earned a bachelor's degree with honors in health education. She earned a master's degree in public health from Yale University and a doctorate in education from Teachers College Columbia University. Dr. Trowell Harris was the first female nurse to command a medical clinic and first African-American female in the history of the National Guard to be promoted to general officer. She is also the first to have a mentoring award in a Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated chapter named in her honor. Dr. Trowell Harris is the recipient of numerous awards, most notably the Air Force Distinguished Service and Legion of Merit Awards, the Dr. James D. Weaver Society Award, most notable, oh, excuse me, named for the distinguished Pennsylvania Congressman and Air National Guard flight surgeon, the, the Eagle Award for Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University for her contributions to aviation, the Air Force Association's National Aerospace Award for Department of Veterans Affairs Employee of the Year 2010, given for the most outstanding performance of duty as a VA employee in her, cons in her consistent dedication to the well-being of our veterans, the Veteran Affairs Outstanding and Invaluable Service to the Community Award, and numerous outstanding performance awards. She is a distinguished alumni of Jersey City State University, Yale University, and Columbia University. It was inducted into the Columbia University Nursery, Nursing Hall of Fame and the Yale University School of Medicine Honor Roll for her dedication to public service. She was honored as one of the 21 leaders of the 21st century by Women's E! News in New York City and was selected October 2014 by the Business and Professional Women's Foundation as a National Businesswoman's Week Award recipient for 2014 as a decorated military veteran and veterans veterans advocate. She is a charter member of the Women's Memorial and in December 2013 established the Dr. Irene Trowell Harris Endowed Leadership Fund at the American Nurses Foundation. The purpose of the fund is to support leadership development of nurses, especially those with military experience and in non-traditional roles. So I hope that is the most I will speak this entire time, <laughs> but that deserves some absolute attention. Um, so needless to say, Dr. Trowles has accomplished more than most of us will accomplish in our dreams. So with that, um, I have some questions that I've kind of scripted to pose to, um, to, to Irene, but if at any point in time there's something that comes up that you would like to contribute or you would like to ask, please feel free to um, jump in and raise your hand and let's, let's, let's let this really be a conversation between all of us interested in, in knowing more about veterans and veteran issues. So with that, Irene? What inspired you to join the Armed Forces? Well, what really inspired me, I had two uncles in World War II. They were in the Army, but one of these uncles uh, really kind of uh, always brought gifts for us from World War II. I didn't really understand what it was all about during that time. We didn't look so sharp in his uniform, 
and she seemed to be able to answer all of my questions. So I thought to myself, you know, I really want to join the military. And he always talked about serving his country. But what happened to me, though, a few years later, we were in the cotton field. I had 10 brothers and sisters. We were picking cotton one day. A jet plane flew over. And I said, one day, I'm going to be up there working and teaching on an airplane. I don't understand why I said that. I've never been near an airplane, but something came to me. And that's when I decided uh, later on to join the Air National Guard. But the first step, though, was getting qualified. You had to be a nurse to join the Air National Guard to become a flight nurse. But the key was becoming a nurse. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, I, had, I was an honor student. I participated in numerous extramural activities. But when I graduated, I wanted to go to nursing school. We did not have the funds. I mentioned this to my church elder one Sunday. She said, well, I'll speak to the minister about that. The very next Sunday, they took up a collection for me to go to nursing school in a little basket. They took up $61.25 in nickels, dimes, and quarters, not one paper dollar. And I needed $60 to get admitted to nursing school. So that church provided the bridge I needed from getting to the cotton field, the nursing school, to the military. And subsequently, I had a chance to attend flight nurse school. And because I loved flying, I immediately was uh, promoted to flight nurse instructor flight nurse, medical crew examiner, and then, exact, and then later on the medical crew director and the flight nurse examiner for all the new nurses coming in. That is a very fantastic story. <laughs> <laughs> so you, so then, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you went from South Carolina then up to New Jersey, correct? Initially I went to, uh, from Aiken, South Carolina to Columbia, South Carolina to nursing school. Okay, so that's where, and exactly. then, okay. Right, and then to Jersey City, right. So that wasn't too much of a culture no, shock. No, not yeah. right. <laughs> You weren't going <laughs> right. too far. <laughs> Um, well, as a young woman, and particularly in that time, and as a woman of color, um, what challenges did you face as you kind of entered the armed forces? Well, there were several challenges. The first thing, as a nurse, since I joined the National Guard as a woman of color, I had to relearn my entire profession of nursing in relation to the, to the air. When you're on the ground, certain medical conditions don't cause a problem, but because the differential oxygen pressure of flying, Different conditions change. For example, eye conditions become worse. If you have a cast on with a fracture, that cast, you may get a swelling and have some circulatory problems. So you have to really learn nursing from uh, uh, the perspective of being in, in, in the air. The uh, second thing was you had to be a great swimmer. I was not a great swimmer, but that was the requirement. So I immediately went to the Y, uh, WCA, and learn how to become a fabulous swimmer. <laughs> I want to be good because in case there's a crash or problem, you need to know how to swim and, and protect your patients. The other thing that was a challenge to me, there were 50 nurses in this class, uh, two African American and 48 Caucasian. So again, the diversity was not the best, but I really didn't let that cause any, any major problem, uh, you know, really uh, for me though. Uh, some of the other things uh, came up was um, the, the numbers uh, took a long time really to, uh, to, 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 to really go, go up. You were so busy in flight school, learning the, the issues and, the, and about flying, you really didn't have a chance to become too concerned. But one of the things that kind of shocked me, everybody had to go to the pressure chamber. The pressure chamber is when you go on flying status, they put you in a huge chamber, and you have an oxygen mask on. To see how long you can function in a flying position, they took your mask off. So you were breathing without oxygen. The whole purpose of that was to see how long you could function. They would tell you to sign your name on a piece of paper, and you would sign your name in about 22 seconds. Your head was on the table, and you were drawing a straight line. So the, but the purpose of that is to train and educate you. You need to function. You take care of yourself first with the oxygen mask, then on the patient. That's the, reason you, that's the reason you hear on the airlines when they tell you, if you're flying with a child, if something happens with the oxygen, you put the child's, you put your mask on first. Or you need to be alive to help take care of, of the other people. So again, that was something I had never experienced and most of us had not. But think about being in a chamber with your oxygen mask and your mask is taken off. And you know you're failing, but you can't do anything about it. 
So again, those were some of the challenges, uh, but I really enjoyed flight school a lot. I learned a lot, and because it was so busy, you had to bond immediately. So the people you met there, they became your friends, and this is something that you really, really enjoyed. But the challenge, like I said, was going into a, an environment that was not very diverse. You had to learn about all the diseases in relation to the air, and going into the pressure chamber. And I did learn how to swim. It was wonderful. <laughs> well, were there men and women in this course with you, of these 50, or was it just 50 women? Or? Uh, well, there, there were uh, three men. Three men? Three, okay. three men, right. There were three, three male nurses, but most were the, the women, though, right. And do you, are you still in contact with any of those? A lot of them, right, right, oh, yes, really? right, yeah, right, yes. Okay. So they were from not just the National Guard, but were active duty and, and the J component. So, yeah, we, we stayed in, 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 in contact, right, yes. And did you ever feel like when you were going through nursing school that you were ever singled out or that for some, you, on your color or just in general? Uh, well, when I went to nursing school, and I think about it, take this in context, I went to nursing school in 1956. And during that point in time in Columbia, South Carolina, there were two nursing schools, one for the Caucasian students and one for the black students. So you had a parallel schedule and you were singing a lot because you put in a separate class. So, so you were entirely separate from? Uh, right, right, so right. So it just yeah. was the two of you then? Right, exactly, though, right. But I was so uh, focused on becoming a nurse because I had what to help my family. Because in the beginning, you know, we didn't even have health insurance. We had no indoor plumbing. We had none of those things that most people have. Um, so I, w I wanted to make sure I was successful. So in the class, uh, within the first year, I was the educational director for my class. The second year, I was the president. In the third year, I was the president of my class. And what I tried to do was to uh, pull the group together and make sure we work together and all become successful. But during that time, the rules were very strict. The curriculum was very tough. Of the 39, 12 of us graduated from nursing school. 12? Right, wow. yes. And by that time, too, uh, the DOD policy was in the whole military, 98% men and 2% women. Wow. And so as you kind of led this incredible career throughout the military, do you feel like you really saw it kind of go through the, the stress and storm of an organization going through change, particularly with um, the integration of, of African Americans into kind of what you were saying, there was no longer the, the separation. And did you feel like it was um, an experience that you were able to help foster and, and play a role in as, as you moved throughout your career? Sure, right, yes. Well, it was quite a challenge because uh, er early on being 2%, so uh, as a matter of fact, when I tried looking at the statistics from uh, 1942, 1956, they were so small, a lot of times they didn't even bother to record them, but even when I joined in April 1963, there were very few minority women in the Air Force, enlisted uh, uh, officer. Uh, there were more in the, in, in the Army at that time. Um, so when you looked at the, uh, in 1962, there was like 2%, but of that 2%, it was hard to measure the Af African Americans. So what I did when I, when I went in, I looked at getting on every possible committee. I mentored students along the way when I was there. I took every course in my field that I could as a nurse. Went to leadership training, went to commander training, I went to everything possible, because I wanted to help the service improve. But they had the Integration Act in 1948, which gave women the authority to serve in the military and have rank. Prior to that, you didn't, you didn't get any rank, you didn't get paid. Now, that law was not changed until 1969. That made, that's when they raised the 2%. The law no longer needed to be 2% in the military. And, that's, and later on, the all-volunteer force came into effect in 1971. So those two things, uh, it's what changed the numbers. Prior to that, it was limited to 2% women across the VA, uh, across the, uh, the government. You also probably remember that until 1971, if you were in the military, any branch, if you got pregnant, you were automatically discharged. Yes, sir. You could not stay in. But that law was changed. So I had some input in looking at the rank structure, women staying in, and looking at senior positions. So what I did, again, I joined. I was the educational chair for the Air National Guard Educational Committee. I became the chair for the Human Resources Quality Board, which looked at 
and listed in office uh, education and ranked across the whole nas uh, National Guard. So again, eventually I, I went on the National Guard Board of Directors to help change the policies. So again, all of these things, working with the team, helped change, but it did take a very long, long time to get that done. And women of my generation have stood on the shoulders of giants who have paved the way for us to, to serve and, and have um, a, a different experience in some capacity. So I thank you from a personal perspective as, as well. So as I mentioned in your bio, you were the first African female in the history of the National Guard to be promoted to general officer. Do you remember where you were when you found out that that <laughs> happened? Yes, I do. <laughs> Uh, I was on active duty then at Bowling Air Force Base, working in the Surgeon General's office. By that time, I had become a full colonel, and I was getting ready to retire from the military, and I had planned to go work for one of the defense contractors. I wanted to do oh. uh, education, but they called me and told me that my name had appeared on the general officer list. So I said, what does that mean? <laughs> because, you know, we were basically told we wouldn't be generals and you know, nurses. So they told me, well, your name came up as being qualified, education, experience, et cetera. And you're going to be competing with all the other nurses in the entire National Guard. So I thought, I'll do the paperwork and do what I need to do, but I didn't take it serious. So I thought, you know, an African American, only one slide at the time, there was no way. I put, turned the papers in, did the interviews, and went on enjoying my job in the Surgeon General's <laughs> office. But two months later, I got a call from the Pentagon saying, you have been selected for promotion to General, Brigadier General. So I said, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> so they said, yes. I said, well, can I get something in writing? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, yeah, we'll, we'll fax the order right, right over. That was in, you know. So anyway, I got the order. And I still was, could not believe this because there were so many nurses out there, highly qualified again, flying status, doctorates, had been commanders, all these kinds of things, the same thing I had done. So I was, just, I was just thrilled beyond words. I really didn't know, and I didn't realize, I hadn't really thought about it by being the first female African American, but uh, it was a wonderful experience and I was just, uh, just so thrilled. But my first thought was, I'm just one person. How can I get women of all colors? How can I get even the men to, to meet the requirement, get the education, get the experience? and also learn the informal political rules. I had great mentors, so that's what really made me successful, really, though. But I needed to start looking back and say, now, what can I do even more now to help change the system? Well, can you speak a little bit about those mentors that you had? Uh, one, of the, one of my greatest mentors was um, in, when I became, when I returned from flight school, I was being uh, educated to be a flight instructor, flight examiner, a dean from a nursing school in Boston said to me, now, you need to go back and get your master's degree. You need to get your doctorate. It may take you a while, but this is what you need to do. So she just kind of mentored me on the politics of what you do in the military, the people you meet, things I need to do, take all those additional courses, and you know, attend meetings. I did that. So she was the first person. When I was a chief nurse executive at a hospital, the base commander, the top person for the flying unit, uh, said to me one day when he came to the clinic, he said, you know, you really need to get your education. You need to go to these classes. He gave me a list, command school, different kinds of leadership. I did that. And fortunately, uh, we played racquetball together. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but he continuously to tell me about the political aspects of the National Guard and things you need to do. And I, I followed his, his advice. And so then what brought you to Teachers College? How did that kind of... Well, uh, what, when I, I had finished my, I just finished my master's degree at Yale Uni University on full scholarship. And I, I wanted to move back to New York because my flying unit was at Brooklyn, in Brooklyn. So I wanted to get back near my flying unit. So I moved back to New York um, and uh, I flew for a few months before I, you know, uh, start back work. I'm looking for a university that I can work in with my schedule, you know, and all the things that's going on with the family. And checking the agenda, I came to TC and spoke to people, I spoke to students, faculty, and looked at the schedule. And this university was the best fit for my, for my, my, my schedule. And what really got me convinced when I walked in the door and started talking to people, I met Professor James Malfetti, 
And you all are too young to know who that was. But he was one of the most famous professors here. And he said, you know, we need more nurses here. We need, we need nurses who've been in the military, don't flying status, you know. But anyway, when I talked to him, I signed up. <laughs> I signed up. But later on, I met Dr. Allegranti also. He was on my doctoral year, you know, committee. So when I met the students here, the people, and I looked at the environment, I decided to come here. And I must tell you, that was one of the best decisions I have ever made in looking at doctoral studies, though. But also what that did, though, that made me look at the world totally different. I want to do policy more. I want to be able to help the system change. But I want to not just want to make policies in the hospital or unit. I want to make national policy. That's what inspired me, though. And so if you kind of had a message to women who are looking at the kind of the work-life balance, you talked about family and, and kind of make, being able to manage career success and going after your dreams, but also having a family, what, what would that message be? What would your advice be? Well, the, it's, it is, you know, it's a very complex um, issue trying to manage your school, your employment, and your kids. Um, but that's the reason I initially joined the Air National Guard, because that way you're not full-time or any, any reserve component. You can get your military training, still fly, have your civilian job, and take care of your family. Uh, it is not easy doing that, and part of what I did, I joined something called the Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Services. That committee looks at all issues in the military, mainly for women, but men too, uh, work-life balance. How can we help people with child care? How can we help them you know, go back to school? If they have uh, issues with their kids, who can they go to? So they look at the whole, whole uh, career path, e education, promotion opportunity, work-life balance, the family issues, and how you work together as a team to get support for your, your issues. So again, uh, it's a matter of getting a good mentor also. In the military, they used to assign people to you. You know, they assign right. uh, yeah. a special person to you. And that person would be your guide in any issues that you had. So again, not many organizations do that, but the military does. They help you look at all of the issues and assign someone to help you resolve those, those, those issues, though. And kind of on that, so the military can be fantastic at times about doing things like that. But they can also fail at times. Yeah, at right, times, right, <laughs> right, yeah. At times to do that. Um, yeah, yeah. What do you kind of see as being one of the, the kind of the major failings that we, we saw for, for women and, and families in the military? And, and then did you play a role in kind of helping resolve it, or do you think it's still an issue currently today? Uh, one of the issues that women always uh, kind of express a concern about was that they want to be in the military, but they also want to have, have, have their family. So as part of the Dakowitz Committee, we looked at, um, uh, it's called, you can take a leave if you had a baby, if you had a, a family member that was critically ill. So if you were in the military, you could take that leave. Historically, you don't do that, but they're, they're doing that now. And all of the services have some type of policy on that. When you leave, you can come back and still have your uh, uh, career. Uh, child care is, is on almost all the uh, military bases, but if you're in the National Guard, there's, there's, there's no base to have a child care. So they're child care issues. So we set up experiments and did get uh, some specific child care for active duty guard and the reserve. But again, what we used to do is ask the women, what are your issues? When they told us what they were, we took those back to the committee. Now, the Defense Advisory Committee is the committee of the Secretary of Defense that looked at all the issues, because they want to maintain and recruit women, highly qualified women. But the key is keeping women, though. Yes, if you have a couple you know, young kids and you're trying to be in the military, you get deployed overseas, it's not easy doing that. So again, that committee looks at all of the issues and try to uh, address those. Um, and think about, if you come in the military, you get deployed, you have to sign your kids over to someone, whether it's a parent, a sister, brother, because when the military said pick up and go to Iraq, Afghanistan, you have to go. So again, but they have the policies, though, that, that address those, those, those kinds of things. So um, one of the things that I was most concerned about even now was when you come back and when you leave the service, transitioning from the military to civilian is not so easy. So a lot of my work at the VA, and a lot of the work I still do, is helping people have that seamless transition. You have to have a new home, 
It's a new job. It's a new child care. It's a new school. So it's, you need to be very specific about how we help people. It still doesn't work as well in some areas, especially in some of the rural areas, but we're still working on that. Interesting enough. So, um, and I kind of failed to introduce myself. I, I'm a doctoral student here in the clinical psychology program, and uh, my advisor is Dr. George Bonanno, who's a lead researcher in resilience. Right, yes. And um, we just recently uh, were in the process of launching a study in partnership with RARE, which is the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, on doing a study that looks at uh, service members as they transition. We understand this is kind of a period where veterans really struggle, this leaving the military and entering civilian life. And we think anecdotally we know why. It's kind of you have to find all these different things, social support and a home and employment, uh, medical. So we think we know, but we don't know for sure. So right, right. we're doing a national longitudinal study looking at veterans before they transition, so when they're still active duty, in this kind of cohesive atmosphere where they have leadership and support, and then following them um, over two years to see what changes. D d does the transition really impact their mental health trajectories in ways that we think it does, or are there other things, other personality factors at play there that could potentially protect them from having um, a kind of a, ch a major change in their mental health trajectory. So I think that's a concern for a lot of different yes, people, right. and mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are, are, are interested in that question. And then, interestingly enough, you mentioned maternity leave. Yes. When I was on active duty, it was it was eight weeks. So that's all you had. You had eight weeks, and right, you had to yes. go back on active. Excuse me, it was six weeks. It was six weeks. It was six weeks. <laughs> six weeks. Um, I took some extra leave so I could stay home for eight. Right, yeah. Um, but now uh, it's 12 weeks. Yes, right, yes. So, the, you know, change happens. It takes time. It um, does, right, yes. But even in the couple years since I've left, there have been um, huge right. impacts on women in the military. So you've played a massive role in that. Thank so thank you very much. So finally, my last question before I kind of open up to everyone. If you had one piece of advice to share with our TC students and newly admitted students, what would that be? I would say to all students, take advantage of every challenging opportunity. Don't necessarily follow where you think your path may lead, but go boldly where there's no path and leave a trail. You know, think about where I started out, in a cotton field in the 1950s. I was able to earn senior flight nurse wings, a doctorate, I wrote two books, became a White House political appointee serving two, two presidents, you know, and all these wonderful things happen. And uh, uh, so to you, just look at those challenging opportunities and don't let failure stop you. If you fail, use that as a learning tool and move on another way. Well, thank you. That is a wonderful note. Never let failure stop you. I, I really like that. Thank you. I feel greatly. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Charles Harris, for answering my questions. But I'm sure there's some other questions out there that people would like to ask um, of either myself or Dr. Charles Harris. So um, please, I'd like to open it up for questions and for discussion. Yes. Um, I've been so impressed by watching. TC has a number of programs in the military. And the more I learn about the military, the more that I'm impressed with uh, the fact that you can lobby for change in the military. You know, I think yes. those of us outside of have an impression you know, that you, you can't speak up, you can't uh, initiate change. But what is that process like? Is it difficult to, to be uh, critical sometimes of, of the military as an institution? And are there career risks? How do you do that process? Well, please, I would actually defer, defer to you on that one. <laughs> yes. um, what I did, um, it's not easy sometimes, but what I did, I always make sure I had my facts together and I had re uh, references. I went to people who I thought had the same opinion I had. And I, as I said before, I joined the committees where you could get change made. Again, it was the, I was chair of the Human Resources Quality Board. They looked at uh, rank structure, they looked at education, they looked at ethnic background, race, women's issues, for the whole whole national, national Guard. So I was able to bring issues there and get change made. And that was just not for office, but for enlisted troops also, though. Uh, when I was on the White House Council of Women and Girls, I was able to bring change there because we worked with 29 other federal agencies, again, looking at job opportunities, education, et cetera, though. Uh, I was chair of the National Guard Education Committee. Look at the whole system, mainly for medics, to see how can we change the educational system to make people more uh, 
uh, you know, more qualified for promotion opportunity. How could we change the system to do a better job with our students? So when I got involved with that again, looking at the facts, I was able to help make change there. Now the key thing is the defense, the advisory committee on women in the service. It's called D DACOWITS. That's 20 men and women who are from around the country, uh, senior people, and the military had advisors to the committee. So I was an advisor for 35 years. First, I was a National Guard. Then I was active duty Air Force. When I went to VA, I was a VA rep to Dakowit. So all those years, I looked at the system again and say, how can we change the system for women, the families? And that's how I, writing, I, I ended up writing my second book about bridges, things we can do to help, help change the system. It's a matter of crossing bridges and also building bridges for others. And that's the reason I got that mentoring award in the military, because I looked around and mentored enlisted troops, housekeeping, building service, nurses, doctors, people who wanted to uh, be promoted to senior job. It's not a, just about the education experience, the political system too. You need to know how that works. And I think just from, from my much, much lower level <laughs> perspective, um, the military is an organization like any other. And I think kind of following appropriate procedures and guidelines, getting your facts, mm -hmm. kind of building an alliance or allies, and, and really trying to see the problem from a bunch of different areas and being able to present that um, as a problem, but also a problem with solutions. And not just presenting a problem, but coming forward with, with ways to solve it the military uh, favors much more, and it also going through kind of knowing the system yes, yes, uh, yes. and going through the appropriate channels and not trying to exact change on your own in some kind of uh, undocumented way. I think right. it really it, it is, is knowing the system and being able to operate effectively within that system. And as you can see, someone who knows it can do it very well and can absolutely affect change on an organization, especially the size uh, of our nation's armed forces. Huge, right. Um, actually, we spoke before. Yes, uh, yes. My nephew, as I mentioned, is joining the Air Force Reserves, and uh, I think April 5th is when he goes to Texas. Mm -hmm. um, my brother in law and sister in law, um, his parents, they're, um, you know, they're a little nervous. They're nervous. They're supportive, but they're nervous. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering um, when you decided after looking up in the sky, seeing the jet, and this is what you decided <laughs> you wanted to do. Yeah. How did your family, I mean, it seems your church community really rallied around you and were able to help you get there, but how did your family feel about uh, you taking that path? Well, initially they were not very pleased because okay. uh, way back then they didn't think women should be in, in the military. Mm -hmm. And the one thing, it was a myth about women going in just to serve men, whatever that meant, they just thought, you know, that was not a good place to be. Uh, but you know, I said to them, you know, this is really what I would like to do. I want to try it. It doesn't work. I can get out. It's culture shock. That when you go in the military, it's very structured. It's a whole different world. And so you, but you learn that, that uh, how the system work, and you work within the system, and you know, you, you can you can pro progress. But interesting, my family didn't really appreciate until I started flying over Europe, and I brought them watches and things from Germany. <laughs> <laughs> they just say, well, maybe this is a good idea. <laughs> but they soon, but their concern was also in flying status. They said, well, you know, planes crash all the time. And I said, yeah, I know that, but, you know, I have to depend on. <laughs> so they came around. They came around, right. But uh, anybody going in, it's going to be a culture shock, mm -hmm. no matter how much you think you know, because the system is so different. And being in a control, where you're being told every day what to do and when to go and schedule, all like that. When you learn the system, you can control that a lot. And as you move up, you can make recommendations. You can make things better for everybody, though. Mm -hmm. so, that's, so we need these young people going in with their bright ideas and their energy to help improve the system still, though. Good. Thank you. Um, is it true, or why is it? Um, let's see how I can phrase it. I'm understanding that if a uh, enlisted person is um, get um, combat promotion to the officer's corps on discharge, they are returned to their substantive rank. Is that true? Say a uh, sergeant 
in combat mm -hmm. is right. promoted to a lieutenant. Right. On this charge, does he return to being a sergeant or he gets the, um, the benefits of an officer? So, for, I mean, we haven't had, at least in my understanding, any battlefield promotions in the recent conflict, so. Oh, I, um, I think, yes, I've read it where a few people, and there really? are some issues around that a few people were promoted like. combat promotion when I think it was in Afghanistan when they were unable to find um, junior officers hmm. and sergeant majors and those people were promoted and on their retirement hmm. or discharge it was said that they were going to go back to the rank that they were at at the point of the promotion to the officer's corps. Now, I, I have not really seen that, but based on history, all the other wars, if you got a battlefield promotion from sergeant to lieutenant, you kept the lieutenant grade. Correct. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, from my understanding, it's from World War II, right, World exactly War I II, right, and right. even the, in the, Vietnam at times. The Vietnam, right, right. Yeah. But when you got that rank, even in Vietnam, uh, you, you retired with that high, highest rank, though. Correct. Right, right. But I'll talk to you afterwards because I would like to follow up on, on, yeah. on that because if that's the way it is, I want to be on that policy committee. <laughs> <laughs> and she's the one you want on her right, side. Right, <laughs> right, right, yes, right. Okay, right, yeah, I, I would like to follow up with that. Was so wrong. Right, right. But yeah. I, you know, understand that it was a temporary acting position. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was not a promotion in the sense that you are promoted to a lieutenant. Right. You are active lieutenant, and you act that role. Mm. On your discharge, you go back to what rank you were. Interesting. I don't like that policy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, one of the things I was reading about as I was looking at different um, graduate programs in social work and clinical psychology and so on was uh, the collaborative kind of efforts, and TC certainly has been a vanguard in that with uh, the work that you mentioned. But the collaborative efforts between uh, scholarship and civilian um, exploration and examination um, academically, and they're partnering with various military branches. And some of the articles I was reading, they lead off with saying this was our biggest hurdle, to partner with the military. It was, we had to get all kinds of permissions. It, it was, uh, we weren't allowed to work with the military. And I, I thought, wow, I've seen this now three times as a lead off. Can you speak to that at all? Is there? Um, I can speak to my current experience. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, it, it is a challenge. It's a challenge for a variety of reasons. And I think it's meant to be, in some ways, protective because uh, I think the Department of Defense really values its people in the sense that they don't necessarily want some outside agency coming in um, and not being able to operate under the auspices and control the Department of Defense. And that sounds more big brother than I mean it to be. I mean it more that they want to ensure that the utmost care is taken towards their people and the best way to do that is in some ways to insulate them from um, outside agencies. So the vetting process is, is extensive. Um, but it's, it's worthwhile, and so I am navigating that currently with, with Walter Reed and the Army Institute of Research, and it's been challenging, but at the same time, it has really allowed me to value kind of the way that the Department of Defense is structured. It, it obviously is bureaucratic for a variety of reasons, and there is a lot of bureaucracy that's involved, um, but I found it that the people in the right places that want to yes. affect change, mm -hmm. that value the questions that you're asking, that understand um, the importance of the research and work you're doing are the people that are going to say, absolutely sign me up, let's figure out how to do this. Mm -hmm. And that's been absolutely my experience where people that are still active duty have said, we have the same questions, you guys have this ability, and we want to make sure this partnership happens. And subsequently, we've, we've been very successful with that. I don't think that's always the case, but there are people that really do want to answer these questions. And, and they want to use the universities also around the world and all over. They want to use the universities to educate their military members. Like every place I was stationed or went, I always find out where the nearest universities were. And if a school had some kind of contract or, or, or connection there. Uh, for example, uh, Georgetown University in the policy department 
they have a special program for military people getting a master's degree in public policy. So they negotiated a contract. It was not easy when they started out, but they have a very busy, active program there now. People come from all over the country to attend school there, and it's a very friendly military uh, university. They have a huge student veterans department that help them coordinate. So it's part of that, part of that education. That has worked out exceptionally well, though. And actually, just to kind of speak on Columbia and Teachers College specifically, uh, Columbia University has the General Studies Program, which has the biggest number of veterans uh, of any Ivy League university. And it was actually created for uh, returning World War II veterans to have the opportunity to uh, receive, you know, a, a a, a great education, and so they have one. Of, they have the highest number of, of veterans in their undergraduate program, and it's called General Studies. And then here at Teachers College, we have the Eisenhower uh, Leadership Development Program, which is in direct partnership with the military, and it trains uh, future tactical officers at West Point. And so they get their master's degree in industrial and organizational uh, psychology, and they go up to West Point, which is just you know an hour up the road. And they're there as tactical officers, which are officers that are assigned to individual cadet companies at West Point and provide uh, mentorship and organizational uh, structure for the cadets up at West Point. So Teachers College has a long history of kind of integration with the military and are very receptive to that as well. This is kind of um, talking about the Resilience uh, Center for Veterans and Families that I live here. Um, my uh, great uncle passed away a couple years ago in his 90s. He was drafted into World War II Battle of the Bulge. He was captured in, um, he, was very, he was young, 17, 18 years old. So he recently passed away. And one of the things he left, he never spoke about what happened. And one of the things, um, clearing his items out after he passed, is all this poetry he wrote. Oh, as a therapy, yeah. like a therapy. Right, yeah. And I actually, yeah. I work um, as a coordinator of the dance therapy department at oh. Sarah Lawrence College. Wow. So um, this kind of leading in, um, and maybe it was the time, I mean, doing things and letting him express himself, and he expressed himself through poetry, creative arts therapy, and things like that. Um, does the Resilience Center here and maybe other efforts that you say, is there more of getting, being able to talk about it, whereas someone, my great uncle, who maybe had to, wasn't able to talk about it, maybe because that wasn't the thing for the time, or um, what efforts are being made um, to maybe let people open up and talk about their experiences after? And I can speak to the Resilience okay, Center. Yeah, you can speak to. Right. Um, so the Resilience Center, like you mentioned, it, it's fantastic. It was recently launched this past year, and it really looks at integrating kind of this idea of cutting edge psychological research and providing care to our veterans. And so we, we do do the research that looks at these different issues, and then the Dean Hope Center, which is an in-house uh, counseling and clinical office, provides free psychological services to veterans and their family members. And the beauty of that is it's it's very, very wide in terms of its description. For example, at the VA, family members can't be seen, um, but, but we see them here, and we see them for free. And it's a veteran of any generation, any war, and we, family member, it's really kind of a loose term. So maybe your care provider was your aunt, then, then, then we will see, we'll see the aunt, or, or for children. And so at least for the Resilience Center, we're trying to approach this as more of um, a collective problem that if you have a system that's kind of um, not operating like it normally would, you want to address the system, not that one issue. So you don't want to just address the issues the veteran is having, but his family members, because th that's meaningful and that matters. So that's currently what we're doing here, but uh, dance therapy is fantastic. There's, yes. there's <laughs> wonderful art therapy programs uh, that do wonderful things with veterans, particularly at Walter Reed. They do some art therapy stuff. So that's there. P to be able to integrate that one day into the Resilience Center would be incredible. Um, we're not quite there yet, but that's, but that's such a fantastic um, point. So thank you very much. Uh, in, in, in the military, uh, the whole family eligible for health care, mental health, et cetera, though. And they have a fairly good program there, but the, the, the challenge, though, is if you're in the military active duty full time, uh, a lot of people don't want to go to the mental health clinic or psychology because you're on flying status, you got a senior job, they'll say, well, if I go there, I, I may lose my status. So the acceptance in the civilian and military community needs a lot of work still but the services are there. 
uh, and the VA uh, is unfortunately is limited to the family, that veteran family member. But we work with tons of veteran service organizations that provide the services, a lot of them for free, given an hour, the code of support. You can go to DA, the American Legion, they will help you get all kinds of services. There's a lot of other services out there. Um, so again, it's being addressed, but again, when it comes to women, most women do not identify as being a veteran. If you go into a room and there's a thousand women there, you say, how many of you are veterans? You may get five hands raised. If you say to them, how many of you serve in the military, they all raise their hand. For some reason, the myth was, if you didn't serve in combat initially, that you are not a veteran. That's not true, of course, but that was, that was the myth. So the big key has been getting women to self-identify as a veteran, going to get their educational benefits, going to health care, get their mental health, get all the support, buying a house and a VA loan. So they have not taken advantage of that, but the services are there. The challenge still is getting people, whether they're in the military or out of the military, to go to seek these, these, these services. We've made a lot of services outside of VA and outside of the military because they don't want to be associated with that. So it's a totally independent group that see people, and they are very good. They are, they're all vetted, they're licensed, and they're all over the country. We have one eight hundred numbers, and even though I've been retired three times, I still get a lot of calls. <laughs> <laughs> and I help them. I, I, I stay in, 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 in contact. With the, with it's what happens when you're good at what you do. That's what happens. You never retire. Uh, and I, uh, please. Um, and I think actually, what are we, how, how are we looking on time? I guess what time is that a lunch? And, uh, we have like maybe lunch begins at 12.30 right now. It's 12.26. So okay. maybe okay. final okay. questions okay. or any final comments. I know that I'm just thinking about the future role and the way that the policy program works is they they recruit veterans from veteran service, services organizations, community colleges, some other places, um, and um, help them in cohorts of students to go to selected four-year colleges and do the program. So it looks like. So this is sort of a general question that you know, answer in three minutes, but I'd love to hear from both of you just some things that you can find in sort of selling that opportunity to veterans in recruiting students, but also how important I think is to mind in supporting veterans on campuses like Vassar, Wesley, and Dartmouth um, that are sort of residential selected for your colleges, mostly 18 to 22 year olds. Um, so just things to keep in mind that sort of support and transition process to you. That was a big question. No, it's a very good question. Yeah, just one of them. I'm trying to think what? Oh, to be support. I, I think it's such a hard question because there's so many pieces that can kind of go into that. I think the biggest thing is, in terms of being supportive, is really looking at veterans is just they're just another person. They may have kind of different experiences and different pathways. And you're gonna find people that are more willing to speak about it than others. Um, but particularly when they may be one amongst a group of people that are not veterans. I've, my experience is that veterans tend to not wanna be singled out for what they've done in their service. They just wanna be part of that group they're now with. So if that's you know a group of, of, of students at Dartmouth, they just wanna be a student at Dartmouth. They don't want to be known as the veteran student at Dartmouth or, or anything else. They really just want to be uh, a, a piece of the whole, if that makes any sense. Um, so I don't necessarily know how to foster that um, or like <laughs> what, um, but that just has been my experience, my impression. Dr. I didn't hear the question. Are you talking about how to reach out to undergraduate students, vets, and come back to the liberal arts college? Um, oh, is that? OK. A piece of it. So a piece I of the program is also um, we recruit students as well. Right. The program. So kind of speaking about the opportunity in the way that um, I think we'll, we'll reach veterans was part of that question and also talking about the support to you on campus and how to sort of tailor that to the well, Thank you for kind of clarifying yeah, sorry, it. Uh, no, I think the biggest thing is for reaching out, it, it's really tapping into the organizations and get that message out to veterans. Um, obviously, the Columbia with a general studies program, it has such a long history. It's been around since you know the late 40s, early 50s. Yes. So mm -hmm. the kind of word of mouth is already there. But when you're beginning new programs, uh, the, the military, at least in the Army, has the uh, the Army Transitioning Program, ACAP, um, which I don't know what that acronym stands for now. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? We have all these acronyms. <laughs> yeah, um, right, that's there's, right. there's, there's <laughs> the requisite transitioning program you have to do when you leave the military. 
and being effectively able to tie in with those uh, organizations and those kind of classes they give and being able to give them information that they could pass along to, to service members leaving the service uh, would be, I think, the best way to target those that are looking for next steps. Right. And, and the, uh, the, military, the Air Force has got something called the transition program for the education before you leave the military, for everything, housing, job, child care. People really need to participate in, in that. That helps them adjust seamlessly. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Charles Harris, thank for you everything. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.